Hello everyone, I'll go ahead and uh, commence our lecture which will probably last somewhere around 15 to 20 minutes 20 minutes is my estimate. Um, a few things, I didn't get to look at the song from Radiohead called Fitter. Um, in fact, I probably will not talk about it and what I will do is allow someone to maybe post something in the discussion forum if they wish uh, to discuss that particular uh, piece of art. If they, you know, Since now I'm not going to cover it, maybe someone else can, which would be great if you're having trouble looking for something. Okay, so basically what I want to do in this last part is there's some things that happened in our readings that I did not get to discuss, which I would like to take a moment to highlight uh, as far as something that would be possibly important for something like the midterm or for a response paper. For instance, where I'm going to begin is at the scene, uh, is around the time of the party uh, when John the Savage refuses to come out to Bernard's party and throws a fit and basically humiliates Bernard by not uh, by not coming out um, and have his people talk behind his back. But another the other things get uh, spliced in there as well, such as on page 177, where we see Mustafa Mond uh, reading a new theory of biology paper. Um, and uh, basically what's... What's significant about that is that one of the things that makes this dystopian, even if some of the some of the things the world say are actually quite pleasant, uh, I mean, getting rid of diseases, getting rid of mosquitoes. I, you know, if you live in Louisiana, like, you know, as long as most of us have, mosquitoes suck, and so, you know, that you know those things seem positive, but the cost seems. Uh, we might sympathize with John a little bit because the cost seems too great. Um, in the sense that, uh, you know, everyone's infantile. There's no progress, for one. If there is signs of progress with someone like Helmholtz, then they are dealt with. And this particular one, with the new theory of biology, um, it becomes anti-progress, anti-intellectual. And Mustafa Mann reads it, and... Um, uh, in fact, one of the things he writes on the paper itself is that the author's mathematical treatment of the conception of purpose is novel and highly ingenious. He means good. But heretical and so far as the present social order is concerned, dangerous and potentially subversive, not to be published. And so, you know, just because it was good, it will not be published because it might upset the stability, because that's what new discoveries do. And so if there's no discovery, there's no... It's stagnant. It's a stagnant culture, which... Uh, you know, for most of us, is not a viable one. Or uh, if you think of Pleasantville, as was referenced in the uh, presentation today, uh, that's one of the things that causes the upheaval, is that things start changing, and change becomes dangerous to stability, as usual. And they actually end up uh, transferring this biology guide to uh, the Americas. Um, in, fact, uh, in fact, Mustafa Mond, on various occasions, gives a sense that, uh, you know, he wonders, he says at the bottom of the page, what fun it would be, he thought, if one didn't have to think about happiness. And as he says later in his talk with John, is that truth is lost at the cost, happiness is gained at the uh, at the cost of truth. That the pursuit of truth is not considered anymore. So that's part of the dystopian, is that, you know, truth gets suppressed. And we'll definitely see that with 1984. Um... Another thing I wanted to mention is on page 179, not too far from that, is when Bernard comes out, well, when John the Savage comes out after the party, and, well, if you think of Bernard and what he's like, he's very unhappy with uh, John. Um, in fact, he makes uh, he makes various accusations. Uh, like, he tries to blame John for not coming out. That it's his fault that he suffered such humiliation. And he realizes that... Uh, there's an injustice to his accusations, but he's so vain and so petty that he continues to do that. Uh, in fact, it says that he nourishes a secret grievance against John, and it says at the bottom of that paragraph, um, as a victim, the savage possessed for Bernard the enormous superiority, enormous superiority over others that he was accessible. One of the principal functions of a friend is to suffer, in a milder and symbolic form, the punishments that we should like but are unable to inflict upon our enemies. Um, and so, you know, because Bernard can't really touch him, he's bitter about it. In fact, that's we kind of see him revenging himself a little bit when he actually introduces the savage to Helmholtz. 
And does mention and just remember about Helmholtz, he gets in hot water too for writing actual poetry, poetry about solitude rather than solidarity, which you know any alone time is highly subversive in this you know in this uh, in this state. Uh, so to do that is to cause to write a poem about it is to cause instability. And naturally, Helmholtz and, and the Savage, who are the two most individualistic characters in this book take to each other immediately, which makes Bernard jealous. You know, Bernard basically becomes a third wheel to them. Um, and to do that, Bernard tries to exact some very small revenges, and you kind of see the satire coming out in this, that he's so petty and, you know, passive, that, you know, he, he's willing to try to hurt someone he admires because, you know, he's feeling left out again. You know, no matter where Bernard goes, he always feels left out. In fact, um, uh, I believe... Um, Savage is reading from a Shakespeare poem, uh, which I believe it's The Turtle and the Phoenix, which is not as popular as other Shakespeare poems, but one of the things that says on page 183, reading from the poem, he says, Property was thus appalled, that the self was not the same, single nature is double name, neither two nor one was called, reason in itself confounded, saw division grow together. And Bernard says, orgy porgy, because those lines from Shakespeare that John values so much with regards to his own solitude is actually uh, is actually expressing something very similar to what the world state actually practices in their solidarity and their u unity. Uh, and of course, you know, uh, that does not make John happy that Bernard um, intrudes in that way. Okay. Um... I also want to talk about Lenina, especially since the only time I mentioned her today was when she got pretty much whipped to death, uh, which is you know, not a good note to leave Lenina on, because she is a very important character, one of the more important characters. In fact, we see some of the flaws in this so-called utopian society on page 187, where she's suffering because she's, she's pining away, basically, for John, because she has not liked anyone as much as she did. In fact, uh, she's kind of the call... Um, cause of a person's death because it says on page 187 that um, she has to question have I given this one its sleeping sickness injection or haven't I? She simply couldn't remember in the end she decided not to run the risk of letting it have a second dose and moved down the line to the next bottle. 22 years later, 22 years, 8 months and 4 days from that moment, a promising young Alpha Minus administrator at um, Wansa Wansa was to die of trypanosomiasis Miasis. Look, that's a long word. The first case were over half a century. So because she was so distracted by her feelings for John that she forgot to give this uh, vaccine to this test tube baby, and it dies as a result at 22 uh, at 22 years old. What a shame. Um, the other thing I want to discuss with regards to Linda is the rape scene, um, the attempted rape scene, because we all know that she wanted John and she couldn't have him. And then, so she takes some Soma and is basically drugged up and ready to, you know, jump John's bones, um, basically. In fact, on page 193, this scene is meant to be somewhat comical because, as we know, despite John seeing Lenina as a Juliet and him a Romeo, they are not compatible in the least. And she's not nearly as innocent as he thinks her and he is not nearly as sexual as she imagines him. So, and then there's kind of, you know, a comical disconnect between them and trying to, you know, consummate their, you know, their relationship in one way or the other. In fact, we see John actually retreating from her when she makes it her advances on page 193. Because um, he does admit that he likes her, and she takes that like, oh, so you want to have sex with me. And uh, it's pretty funny when, um, uh, where it says, she too had poetry at, at the very bottom of the page, hug me till you drug me, honey. She too had poetry at her command, new words that sang and were uh, spells and beat drums. And so she's basically uh, reciting this very simple poetry um, that, you know, the world state has uh, told her. And one thing I think that's important about that is, you know, John thinks himself unique in his ability to read Shakespeare and things like that, but what it actually kind of shows is he's just as much a product of his upbringing and his uh, environment, just as much as all these other people that he despises are, such as Lenina. 
Um, and eventually, as you might guess, John does not react well. In fact, he grabs her list and, wrist and starts to get violent with her in a way that almost anticipates him whipping her later on. Because he wants something. In fact, he calls her a whore and a strumpet, which is, you know, these terms are unknown to the world state citizens because sex in common is a norm. It's not something that, you know, generally uh, is looked down upon. Um, another thing that's notable with regards to the dystopian nature of the world state is the hospital. And I think that's something to be very aware of. In fact, um, uh, the hospital doesn't, it, in ways it kind of anticipates the hospitals like today, because basically the way they are dying is the same way that we try to make uh, people in our own world, you know, die comfortably. Which, you know, for us is kind of reasonable, but for someone like John's mindset, it's... Uh, you know, it's not because there's something noble and you know suffering before you, before you die. And, um, here, there's no need for it. There's no need for suffering of any kind. In fact, uh, they're dying with modern conveniences. Linda's on her soma holiday. They have, uh, you know, they have televisions, I think, or something uh, like that. They have the conveniences and are comfortable. Um, and then almost in a what I think of a horror movie fashion, you see these little children, these uh, Delta children, uh, move into the room where his mother is. Um, in fact, on page 201, towards the bottom, it says, A sudden noise of shrill voices made him open his eyes, and after hastily brushing away the tears, looked round. What seemed an interminable stream of identical eight-year-old male twins was pouring into the room. Twin after twin, twin after twin. They came, a nightmare. Their faces, their repeated face, where there was only one between the lot of them, puggishly stared, all nostrils, and pale, googling eyes. So, you know, it's meant to be described, in, I mean, it's partially comical and partially horrific to have all these same little kids piling into one room. I mean, that, it, as you're trying to mourn your dead mother, or your dying mother, um... It says their uniform khaki, all their mouths hung open, squealing and chattering. They entered in a moment. It seemed the ward was maggoty with them. They swarmed between the beds, clambered over, crawled under, peeped into the television boxes, made faces at the patients. And what this is all about, as the nurse informs us, is death conditioning. That they become desensitized to death. So that it's not regarded as a big deal. Um... I'm sure many of you, unfortunately, have had to go to funerals at some time in your life, and the expectation is that you're going to treat it as a solemn occasion, that you're, you know, if you titter, people are more than like, in a tr traditional funeral, people are probably going to glare at you if you titter or tell jokes or something like that. Because, you know, you're supposed to honor the memory. And here, there's, meant there, it's taught to have no memory of, you know, of others' death at all, that you go on living. Well, because if you're too busy mourning the memory of somebody, you're not going to be able to consume the goods that are being produced. And so there's always a distraction. And this is, and this is what the nurse calls death conditioning. To desensitize these little kids to death, so it's not a big deal. That you're, you know, it's all part of the common good. In fact, John threatens their death conditioning because, one, well, he um, basically strikes one of the kids when he gets too annoying, because they are a little, you know, they're conditioned to be little brats, <laughs> generally speaking. Um, in fact, uh, to try uh, to try to uh, you know keep them occupied, they're told to go play a game of Hunt the Zipper, one of their sexual games. Um, and later, when uh, John starts mourning Linda after she passes, on page two hundred six. Um, in fact, it says the savage start is covering his face with hands, with his hands, and he sobbed uncontrollably because you know he's experiencing the you know the you know typical emotion of feeling the loss of Linda and feeling her death. But of course, the world state citizens don't understand this, and um, in fact, one of the nurses complains uh, towards the bottom of the last full paragraph. It says. Uh, it says, undoing all their wholesome death conditioning with this disgusting outcry, as though death were something terrible, as though one mattered as much as all that. You know, in a, a collective society as this, 
one person does not matter. And in fact, I think earlier the director of Hatcheries or Henry Foster at the beginning of the book even said that, well, if one dies, they're just a cell of the organism. There's always another cell to take the place. And typically speaking, if you think of it in our own terms, it's we're not so different from the world state in that regard. Um, while we still retain our emotions and um, our feelings for others, they're, you know, if somebody dies, say in a job is like say somebody has a job position um, and they die, well, you create a vacancy in the market in a lot of areas, such as the hum- humanities, especially. Um, you know, there will be plenty of people to come take their place and you know, um, take over those duties. Now, obviously, we're not as callous as the world state citizens are, but in some regards, it seems like we make we could be moving that way. Uh, you see that in move. You see that in films, and you generally hear about it all the time. Say, you're the second in line of a Fortune 500 company. Sometimes you might want the CEO to die so you can be the big man with the big big man or the big woman with the big pants. Generally speaking, that's just the nature of that's the nature of the mark of you know market economics basically. Okay. Um, and one thing I do want you to pay attention to is to calm the children. They're given, you know, they're given chocolate eclair. So, you know, you give sweets to pacify. It's basically a pacifier so that they don't feel so bad about the death as, you know, in the same way that John does. And this, of course, re- leads to the summer revolt, which we already covered. Um, one of the last things I want to cover is I want to look more in depth at the exchange between Mustafa Maud and John the Savage. On page 219... You know, um, in Mustafa Mon's office, there are books about Ford, and you know it gives you a general sense of how much influence you know the great Ford has, and he even tells Marx that um, because he makes the laws, he can break them with impunity. So there's a double standard here. World controllers can have things like Shakespeare and things like uh, things like Shakespeare that are or th- old things that are you know kept hidden away from the, your normal everyday world state citizen. They still have access to that, and we'll see a similar dynamic of a double standard in um, 1984 as well. Um, uh, let's see. On page 220, he tries, he, and as I said before, he tries to reason with the savage. He said, in fact, he even says that, uh, you know, there's a for stability, there's a price to pay. Um, he says, you at the bottom of page 220, he says you. You've got to choose between happiness and what people used to call high art. Excuse me. We've sacrificed the high art. We had the feelies and the scent organ instead. So kind of a sense of degraded mass culture that, you know, um, like it, what we would probably call like B-movies and things like that, just cheaply produced for the, for the sake of consumerism itself. Not to, you know, spark any thought or anything of that nature which would be unsettling and cause, you know, thoughts of changing the status quo. But right now it's so easy to maintain the status quo that that's what they want to do. Um, 221, um, he even said, he even, the world controller admits that actual happiness always looks pretty squalid in comparison with the overcompensations for misery. And I think I touched on that earlier about, um, you know, when you have things like anthrax bombs um, and things like that going on that, uh, you know, you might be willing to trade, you know, uh, some of your freedom, your, your security for something more safe. Um, uh, 9, 9-11, for instance, uh, the attack on, you know, New York City is kind of a prime example of that, because then you have the TSA and you have Homeland Security established as a result. Um, and one thing that I want to talk about and note about the the theme of eugenics, for instance, which is an important theme, but this isn't a purely eugenic society. Uh, in fact, it's controlled eugenics. Um, they have the possibility to make everyone great. In fact, they had a society of alphas on an, the island Cyprus, as described on page 223. It didn't work. There was too much instability because everyone wanted to be the top dog, because you know, that's kind of what alpha means, is to be on top, to be the top of the crust. And so that's one of the reasons, it, it gives reason as to why there are still ca- a caste system in place that keeps people in predetermined social, pl- uh, you know, social strata. Um, 
And taking a look at the World Controller's own background, you get a sense of, you know, that he was also a smart man. That he, he ran in the same trouble as Helmholtz and Bernard and things like that, and he chose to become a World Controller rather than be sent to an island. And one thing that's usually questioned in Utopias is violence, which um, is one of the things that John the Savage comes up with, like, people have a need to get aggression out. Um, and on page 239, we see that they've embedded what they call violent passion surrogate to, you know, make sure that that is handled. Okay, I think that is generally mostly what I want to cover. If you have any questions, be sure to, you know, raise them. Um, some of the things that you've seen in this lecture could end up on the midterm, uh, because anything that shows up in the book, even if I didn't get to spend enough time on it, could show up. Um, but I'm usually pretty good about including things that are in discussion, including these online discussions. Um, so, all right, that's it for now. I'll see you guys in class on Tuesday.